Madam President, it's my understanding that there are, uh, will be two votes at approximately 12.30. One is on the amendment offered by the Senator from Utah, Senator Hatch, and the other by the Senator from Arizona, Senator McCain. Um, I um, would like to explain in a few minutes why I think it's advisable for the Senate to uh, not adopt either of those two amendments. Let me first address the um, amendment offered by, the, from my, by my good friend from Utah, Senator Hatch. Um, there are a lot of people looking for work. Today, about 14 million Americans are looking for work. And more than 6 million have been out of work for about six months, or at least six months. These are Americans looking to put in a good day's work, looking to provide their family. At the same time, many employers can't find enough skilled workers to fill the jobs that are open. It's very difficult because employers need people with specialized skills. It's becoming more and more true each passing year. They need workers who are good at math. They need workers who are good with their hands or trained in high-tech machinery. The bottom line is employers need an educated and skilled workforce. Trade adjustment assistance can help bridge this gap. Trade adjustment assistance can train workers and connect them with employers who are looking to grow their businesses. Let me mention a fellow who um, has been a big beneficiary who has been helped by this program. His name is Chris Allen. Chris lost his job at Montana Tunnels in Jefferson City in Montana in May 2009. And because of trade adjustment assistance, Chris was able to go to school at the Helena College of Technology. He wanted to be a diesel mechanic, and he made the dean's list most of the semesters. In May 2000, he graduated, 2011. In fact, he got his degree on a Friday and started work the very next Monday. His new job at New Holland Trader Company in Belgrade earns him $18 an hour. And Chris hasn't stopped there. He continues to hone his skills at Montana Resources keeping up to date on the latest technology and machinery. In this fast-paced globalized economy, human capital is the key to our country's competitiveness and economic vitality. Americans, like Chris, know the benefits of a good day's work, but he couldn't have done this without trade adjustment assistance. And that's why I must oppose the Hatch Amendment. The amendment would withhold trade adjustment assistance benefits of this bill until the free trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama are approved. It would delay Americans like Chris from getting the help they need to find good paying jobs. And the amendment would delay businesses like New Holland Trade Company from hiring employees and growing their company. The Senate is here this week to consider the GSP trade adjustment assistance bill. It is my hope the Senate will pass it in short order, and we will send the bill to the House, which is expected to pass it shortly. We have an agreement that is agreement between the leadership of both the House and the Senate, an agreement on how the Congress will consider trade adjustment assistance and also how to consider free trade agreements. There is no need to legislate this process. In fact, doing so could substantially delay the process and disrupt this agreement. Not just disrupt trade adjustment assistance, but disrupt the passage of free trade agreements. I might add, Madam President, that there's a difference between the legislative process with respect to trade adjustment assistance and free trade agreements. Trade adjustment assistance is legislation. It goes through the usual legislative process. It can be delayed. Um, it, there's no requirement that it be voted on. That is not true with free trade agreements. Once the president sends up a free trade agreement, it enjoys a certain fast-track process under which there must be a, a vote in both bodies after, after a certain period of time. So there really is not parity between the two. There's not parity between the legislative process in one and the special fast-track process for the other. It is why the agreement was reached, encouraging trust on both sides for the trade adjustment assistance amendment to be passed by both bodies first, 
before the president could send up the free trade agreements. He's indicated he will do so. And it's my, I have very strong assurance from the White House that's the case. And in fact, that is the agreement with the leadership. If the trade adjustment system is passed, and then the free trade agreements can come up and voted on and passed in, in the House, and then voted on and passed in the Senate. So the best way to support our trade agenda, and the best way to support free trade agreements, is to not accept the amendment as put against the, the amendment offered by my good friend uh, from, from Utah, so we can get both passed very quickly. Madam President, um, virtually the same is true with respect to the amendment offered by Senator McCain. Madam President, I oppose Senator McCain's amendment um, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, oppose his amendment. He wants to go back and, and, and undo some of the progress was made in trade adjustment assistance. Let's start with the 2002 Trade Adjustment Assistance Law. That made important changes in trade adjustment assistance. In fact, I helped write that law. In 2002, trade adjustment assistance covered manufacturing workers, and it covered workers whose jobs shifted to countries with which we had a free trade agreement. So it covered workers who were manufacturing, lost their jobs, and it covered workers whose jobs were shifted to countries with which we had a free trade agreement. That is, did not cover other aspects of American employment, like services, and did not cover a job shifted to countries with which we did not have a free trade agreement. That 2002 law not only covered manufacturing workers and workers whose jobs shifted to countries with which we had a free trade agreement, it also doubled training funds, doubled it. Training is so critical. It also provided a new tax credit to help Americans better afford health insurance for themselves and their families. Madam President, that is no small item. We all know how hard it is to get health insurance, especially for individuals and small firms. We're not talking about big companies. We're talking about individuals who have lost their jobs. We also know how expensive health care is. Therefore, the great need for health insurance. Again, that 2002 change in trade adjustment assistance doubled training funds. It doubled training funds. It, training is so important in today's modern society, and it provided a new tax credit to help Americans better afford health insurance. Our economy has changed since 2002. America's strength in manufacturing expanded to include a robust services sector, which is now 80 percent of our economy. 80 percent of our economy, Madam President, today is services. It's all the things. It's call centers, insurance, everything you think of. It's, um, it's insurance, and it's, it's, it's characterized as services. And America's trade with foreign nations is expanded to countries like China and India, big countries with which we do not have free trade agreements. So services sector is expanded is just since 2002, and there's trade, we have trade with other countries who are not, with which we do not have free trade agreements. I believe that trade adjustment assistance should cover workers in both manufacturing and services, and it should cover workers whose jobs move to any country, especially China, whether it's an FTA country, free trade agreement country, or not, any country. These changing realities have prompted me and my colleagues to update that program, update it from what it was in 2002, updated in 2009, and the updated 2009 law brought trade adjustment assistance of more fully into the 21st century by providing Americans with training for the new economy. Unfortunately, those expanded provisions expired in February. They're gone. And that had a big impact. Thousands of workers were denied access. Thousands. Because of the expiration of, of the expansion of trade adjustment assistance. For example, more than 1,000 services sector workers in both Texas and Virginia were denied TAA benefits when the 2009 law expired earlier this year. These workers likely would be eligible under the trade adjustment assistance compromise I negotiated with Chairman Camp. Chairman David Camp, Chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, and I and our staff spent a lot of time getting an agreement, an agreement on trade adjustment assistance, what the provision should be, uh, how far the expansion should go and how it should be paid for. It was an agreement, a bipartisan agreement. There's not much of that around here, Madam Chairman, but we worked hard and, and got the job done. 
I must say, however, under Senator McCain's amendment, these workers I mentioned, these service workers, would remain shut out. They wouldn't qualify. So I think, rather, it's time to, to bring us into the modern world. It's time to provide equal access to all Americans, regardless of whether they work on a factory floor or a call center. It shouldn't matter if you lose your job on account of trade. You should get traded jobs and assistance benefits. And also, regardless of whether the job moves to Mexico, a country with whom we do have a free trade agreement, or if the job moves to a country like China, a country with, uh, with whom we do not have a free trade agreement. So I therefore urge my colleagues to, uh, to oppose the McCain Amendment. I, don't, I think it's unwise, and I might add something else too, Madam President, Madam President and that's this. If either of these two amendments pass, guess what? It gets all gummed up over in the House. And the House, therefore, cannot take up the Clean Trade Adjustment Assistance Amendment. And we have to go back all over again, to amend it again, back and forth. And you know what that's going to do? It's going to do two things. That's going to jeopardize passage of an updated trade adjustment assistance. And guess what else? It's going to jeopardize passage of free trade agreements. I think a vast majority of members in this body and in the other body together want both these matters passed. But I must say, if we had amendments here, um, despite their being uh, defective on the merits, but if the amendments are added, it's going to delay the process further. House is going to amend again, send it back over here, and it's going to uh, it very much delay the passage of both trade adjustment assistance and um, free trade agreements. It's for those reasons, I urge that both amendments uh, not be agreed to. Madam President. I yield the floor. <laughs> Madam President. Senator from Utah. Uh, nothing of the sort is going to happen. The fact of the matter is, is that we've had nothing but delays by the President. Just a few weeks ago, he was accusing us of not passing the free trade agreements when he knows that we can't even consider them until he sends them up. There have been a lot of games played with us. I remember last spring in our committee when the trade representative said, we will definitely, we have a few more things we have to work out on Panama and uh, Colombia, and, and we will definitely bring this, these, send these free trade agreements up before the August recess. August recess, we got near August recess and said, oh, well, look, we need one other thing. We need trade adjustment assistance. Now, now, if they need trade adjustment assistance, and I have no doubt that's going to pass in the Senate uh, if there is a fair process here, uh, and I don't believe there's any doubt it'll pass in the House. And the agreement worked out by the distinguished uh, chairman and, and, uh, and Chairman Camp uh, over in the House uh, probably will be, will be voted on. I have to vote against it. But the fact of the matter is, all my amendment does, it does evidence some, some, uh, some distrust of this process. All my amendment does, it says, look, we're not going to allow trade adjustment assistance to go into effect until these three trade agreements are sent up by the President, passed, we're, they can pass, both bodies can pass the trade adjustment assistance on this bill. And that's fine with me. But my amendment says TAA does not go into effect until the President submits these amendments, the, these three treaties, and they are passed and, and become law. Then trade adjustment assistance goes. I mean, that's a very fair way of doing this. It's a way of uh, saying to everybody, let's get rid of the mistrust. Let's do this in a straight-up way. Let's do it so everybody knows what's going to happen. Trade adjustment assistance will ultimately come into effect, but only after the administration lives up to submitting these uh, trade agreements and they're passed. Now, why would we want trade adjustment assistance to pass if these three, tra three trade agreements don't pass? And it's just another, another uh, big cost to the government. Keep in mind, the people who are out of work are getting unemployment insurance. What trade adjustment assistance does is add payments on top of that to their unemployment insurance. <laughs> I mean, why would we do that if we're not going to have these three trade agreements become law? It just makes sense. Mine is a practical amendment. It says, let's get rid of the game playing. We'll do this if you do this. And frankly, the President's promised to do it, and we still are standing here waiting for the three trade agreements to be sent up here. And to me, it's, it's, it, 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 it's hard to imagine why the President isn't doing this. 
Now, by the way, on the trade adjustment assistance, 7% of our non-government workers, a little less than 7%, are unionized. And yet a third of these payments will go to union members. Now, I, I think there's a... I don't blame my colleagues on the other side for wanting to help anybody who's out of work or anybody who belongs to a trade union. But do we always have to do it in a slanted way that helps one small sector of the, of the uh, workers in this country and not the rest of them? Now, it's a problem. We have, uh, uh, we have unemployment insurance to take care of people who are out of work. We should do that. And it's important that we do that. Trade adjustment assistance just adding some more payments on top of that. Uh, there's a real question whether we should do it here because I ask in the committee, the representatives of the administration, are going to be lost as a result of these three agreements. And they couldn't come up with one. But there will be, according to the administration, 250,000 new jobs that will occur, or at least jobs that will, that will, be, uh, that will occur and will be sustained by these three trade agreements once they are enacted into law. Now, just yesterday, my friends on the other side voted down trade promotion authority. I can't imagine why any president would not want trade promotion authority. It's mind-boggling to me that this president doesn't want it. It's the only way you're going to be able to get tr free trade agreements done. Otherwise, you're going to have to do it through the treaty process, which is much more arduous, much more difficult, and does not, not come up with just a, an up or down vote. Look, there's a reason for this process, and that is to be able to do free trade in this country. And yet, every time we turn around, there's another roadblock thrown up by our friends on the other side, like they don't want free trade. Now, I understand that for some, I think, unsubstantiated and, uh, and ridiculous reason, the unions don't like free trade agreements, even though they're going to create, according to the administration, 250,000 new jobs, or, or jobs anyway. Why wouldn't they like those? They have an opportunity to unionize companies that, uh, uh, that uh, come into existence. And by the way, even under the stilted, one-sided National Labor Relations Board that currently exists, that is running away with our responsibilities and legislating from a regulatory bench, even with that board, unions win 60 percent of union elections, contested elections. It isn't like they're being picked on or they're not treated fairly. And by the way, I'd be one of the first to try and make sure they are treated fairly. I'm one of the few people in this whole body who earned a union card and worked in the building construction trade unions for 10 years. Now, I acknowledge that the distinguished president sitting there in the chair earned a union card. I'm not sure you could really call that a union, working with the <laughs> <laughs> Just joshing. <laughs> you know, the entertainers, entertainment industry unions, uh, they're not like our AFL-CIO where we, we're tough as nails. On the other hand, I've got to retract that because I've seen some people in the entertainment industry tough as nails, and the president sitting here is one of them. No question about it. I have great admiration for him. But he ought to be with me on this. He ought to be with me because all we're saying is look. And, and the most that would happen is a few days enough to get the, the free trade agreements passed in the House. So what I'm saying is this. First of all, let's get the president to do what he has blamed us for not doing, and that is send up these three trade agreements, these three free trade agreements, to these countries that are so important to us, and we're important to them, and we're losing business every day because this has been dragged out so long. Send them up so we can vote on them. TAA will pass here. And I believe it will pass over there in the process we have. And all I'm saying is it doesn't become effective because we shouldn't be paying for people when we don't have free trade agreements that are the basis for paying people. And all I'm saying is they don't come into existence, or the TAA doesn't come into existence until after these three trade agreements are, ratified, are, are voted up and down and become law. Voted up and become law. That's fair. It's an intelligent approach to it. 
It ends the mystery. It ends what some people think is a convoluted process. It ends what some people think is not a, not a, uh, a good faith process. And it does it in a way that doesn't hurt anybody and just says, look, let's do it straight up so there's no more arguing or moaning or groaning or accusations that one side's not being fair or the other. Let's just do it this way. So I'm calling on my colleagues on the other side to vote for my amendment. They don't lose a doggone thing. In fact, it will help this process along. And that's one reason why I brought it up. I personally don't, I, I personally am not sure that the, the trade adjustment assistance will pass without my amendment. And that's one reason why I brought it to the floor. Because it's a fair, decent, honorable way of saying, okay, let's get rid of the mysteries here. Let's get rid of the arguments. Let's get rid of the, uh, the partisanship. Let's vote on these three trade agreements, uh, or excuse me, the, the trade adjustment assistance, which is going to add a lot of money to, to the cost of this government. Let's vote on them. And when they're both voted through by both the House and the Senate, then let's bring up the three trade agreements, which should pass readily in both houses. And once they become law, trade adjustment assistance comes into being. And that's a fair, responsible way of doing this in a way that does away with the mystery, does away with the partisanship, does away with the Democrat Republicanism, it, it, and, and gets this process down the road. For the life of me, I can't understand why anybody would argue against that. And I think that uh, I'm calling on my Democratic friends and let's be bipartisan about this. Let's send the message to the President. We want those doggone uh, uh, trade agreements up here. He controls that process. And I just found it astounding when he came out and said, I wish they'd pass the free trade agreements, the three free trade agreements, when he knows we can't till he sends them up. So this, ends, uh, this, this, this agreement is not only fair, it's the right thing to do. And it may be the only way we're going to get these three free trade agreements done. Uh, I would like to hear a really good argument against them because there isn't any. And I really believe in these free trade agreements. I really believe that there will be thousands of jobs created. I'm not sure it'll be 250,000 like the administration claims, but I believe there'll be many, many jobs at a time when we need jobs. And, and on trade adjustment assistance, there are a lot of sincere people in this body and the other body who believe that that is absolutely essential, even though there was not one shred of evidence, as far as I heard, that any jobs would be lost as a result of these three trade agreements. But I'm willing to, uh, to understand that there may be some loss, and therefore, uh, and, and even if they aren't, to get these three free trade agreements through, the other side says we've got to pass TAA. Well, fine. Let's pass it to both bodies. Let's make it subject to getting the three free trade agreements passed into law because it should be subject to that. There's no reason in the world why we would cost more spending from a TAA standpoint, trade adjustment assistance standpoint, unless you have these three free trade agreements. That's the argument for the trade adjustment assistance that our colleagues on the other side and some on our side are making. I have a feeling this is the way to get this done. It's a smart way to get it done. It's the honorable way to get it done. It's a truthful way to get it done. It's the bipartisan way to get it done. And I think people know that I have a reputation for being able to bring both sides together from time to time. And, and that's what I'm trying to do here. This is not a political game as far as I'm concerned. I do want these three free trade agreements because I know it would be great for our country. We're losing business. We've gone down from 74 percent agricultural exports to Colombia to 28 percent. Now, anybody with brains would have to say, we shouldn't have allowed that to happen. And it wouldn't have had we passed these three free, three free trade agreements, or at least the Colombian one, uh, last year. But Korea's even is even uh, has the potential of being even a greater trading partner than Colombia. Although, when I look at what President Uribe and uh, 
And President Santos, the current president, have done to straighten out that country and get rid of the FARC, the terrorists, and to bring down the violence against union members and so forth, they deserve our support. They deserve these agreements. When I look at Korea and what an important partner they are in our trade, and we're losing trade to them now, others are taking it away from us because we haven't passed the Korean agreement? My gosh, it doesn't take any brains to realize that we're not acting like friends to Korea. And then look at Panama. Panama is one of the financial centers of this hemisphere. They're in, it's a great nation. It's important to us above all people. It's dishonorable for us to not pass the Panamanian free trade agreement that they worked out with us and had to add labor language in each one of these agreements that wasn't there before because of this administration's fealty to organized labor. Fine. Why don't we do what has to be done to pass these three trade, free trade agreements and to get the support for TAA that, uh, for those who believe that's the right way to go and, uh, and get rid of uh, any kind of concerns that one side or the other won't live up to its share of the, of the battle. My amendment will do that. And uh, I hope it's not just a partisan vote here. I hope that we have some Democrats who will vote for my amendment. And I think if we do, I think it would push this whole process forward in a way that makes sense. Mr. President, let me just dwell a few minutes on one other thing that I'd like to kind of get across, and that is that people ask me why I spend years working towards a leadership position on the Senate Finance Committee. It's pretty simple. The Finance Committee has jurisdiction over issues that matter not only the people of Utah, but everybody. The bloated tax code that we have, uh, uh, inheritance taxes, health programs such as Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, and issues that go to the heart of international trade, such as customs, duties, tariff and import quotas, and free trade agreements. I could go on and on. It's a very, very important committee. Sixty percent of all spending in this government comes through the Finance Committee. And being the lead Republican on the Finance Committee gives me a unique platform to shape all of these policies in a way that works best for my home state of Utah, and I hope the nation as a whole. Today, I want to focus on international trade and why I'm so passionate about opening new markets to our goods and services. It gets repeated ad nauseum that 95% of our potential customers live outside of the United States. And there's no doubt that trade is vital to America's competitiveness. But trade has immediate importance and particular importance to jobs and the economy in my home state of Utah as well as every other state. Last year alone, Companies in Utah shipped over $13 billion in merchandise exports to international markets. $13 billion, supporting nearly 93,000 jobs in our state. Think about that. $13 billion in close to 100,000 jobs thanks to products Utah companies sold outside the borders of the United States. And my state is only one state. I think every state can uh, tell a similar story. That doesn't even include our service providers who similarly take advantage of opportunities across the globe. Companies in Utah exported over 194, uh, uh, exported two over 190 foreign markets. Companies such as Varian Medical Systems, which produces cutting edge x-ray products that assist with various cancer treatments and industrial security screening, and which provide over 700 people with good paying jobs in our state. By removing barriers to trade, free trade agreements level the playing field for our companies operating in markets abroad. This had an, has an immediate and observable impact on trade. Following the impl Im implementation of every U.S. bilateral or regional free trade agreement, Utah has increased its export, exports to partner countries. Let me just give you two examples. Utah's exports to Morocco 
experienced growth of over 2,000 percent after the U.S. implemented a free trade agreement with them. And Utah's exports to Singapore increased by over 800 percent after we implemented that FTA. Listening to some of the pundits, it would be easy to draw the conclusion that exports and free trade are only important to large multinational companies, but nothing could be further from the truth. In 2008, the most recent year for which we have statistics, 86 percent of Utah's exporting companies were small or mid-sized companies. For the entrepreneurs that lead these small and mid-sized companies, international trade is their lifeblood. But exports are only part of the story. Thanks to low taxes, family-friendly values, and a well-educated, motivated, and internationally savvy workforce, Utah is a place where people want to live and work. And it isn't just the greatest skiing in the world, although that certainly is a draw. When foreign companies look to grow their operations or gain a foothold in the U.S. market, they increasingly look to Utah to site their operations. These companies invest significant amounts of capital to open or expand facilities in our state every year. Foreign-owned companies employ over 34,000 workers in Utah. That's more than 3 percent of all Utah employees in the private sector. These are well-paying jobs. U.S. subsidiaries of uh, foreign companies pay an average compens compensation of over $68,000 per year. And let's not forget all of the spending by international visitors to our world-class colleges and universities, ski resorts, and parks. That's why I've been pushing so hard to get the three FTAs with South Korea, Panama, and Colombia passed and implemented. It's not the only reason, but it's certainly a reason. These agreements have been sitting idle for far too long. They were negotiated during the administration of President Bush. They were wrapped in a bow for President Obama, ready to go the day he took office. Uh, his own administration has, uh, has, has made some changes in them that, the country, that these three countries have agreed to, yet President Obama still hasn't sent them to Congress for a vote, which is astounding to me. The President himself says that these three agreements will create 250,000 new jobs. His failed stimulus, his burdensome overregulation of business, his penchant for taxing and spending to, quote, redistribute wealth, unquote, all rub salt in the wounds of a difficult economy. We're now left with an unemployment rate of 9.1 percent. You'd think that the President would be eager to do something everyone agrees would actually create real jobs. Not just real jobs, good, great jobs. But the FTAs with South Korea, Panama, and Colombia remain on his desk. And while the President stands still, the world continues to forge ahead. China continues to pursue policies that boost its growth at our expense. Other countries around the world continue to negotiate trade agreements that exclude the United States, putting Utah exporters at a serious disadvantage, as well as other states. The consequences of this administration's trade paralysis are real. By way of example, the U.S. share of Colombia's agricultural imports has already fallen from nearly 44 percent in 2007 to 21 percent in 2010. The EU and Canada swooped in to fill this vacuum. Both have now negotiated free, tra free trade agreements with Colombia. During President Bush's presidency, we passed trade agreements with 14 countries, providing a significant boost to the U.S. economy. By contrast, President Obama hasn't submitted a single trade agreement to Congress. It certainly doesn't help that the President has refused to spend any political capital to seek trade negotiating authority from Congress. The need for it is obvious. Without it, we can't pass good agreements to open foreign markets for our exports. That's why every president since FDR has sought this authority. Why doesn't this president? I think it's a lack of experience, personally. He's smart enough to understand this. He's a brilliant man. And he's a good human being. But why hasn't he sought this authority? Well, every president but one has sought it. The only one that hasn't is our current president. But whether he seeks it or not, I'm going to work to see that he gets it. And when he does, you can be sure that it will be designed to shape his negotiating objectives so that the resulting agreements embody high standards that best serve the economies of the United States, and in particular, my home state of Utah. It is vital that future trade agreements, such as the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement between the United States and six other nations, protect the intellectual property 
of our innovators and content creators leveled the playing field for our companies, which are often forced to engage in lopsided competition with state-owned companies, and national champions enable modern-day integrated global supply chains uh, and enhance market access for both goods and services providers. In the months and weeks ahead, we have the opportunity to shape the economic future of our great nation and my own great state of Utah. I'm going to do my part to ensure that trade plays a central part in that equation. And I hope that everybody in this body realizes how important this is and that we shouldn't keep playing these games just because we have political opportunism. Then again, that's another reason for my amendment. My amendment says the games will be over. Both sides will vote on TAA. Both sides, the president will have to submit the agreements. Once the agreements are passed and, read, and, 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 passed and made into law, TAA comes into existence, and it shouldn't come into existence until after these agreements are, are, uh, are after these agreements become law. And what it says to everybody is, look, the games are over. This is the way to do it. This is the fair way to do it. This is the bipartisan way to do it. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get these free trade agreements passed? Wouldn't it be wonderful, a wonderful achievement for all of us here? A bipartisan achievement with the president getting lots of credit for it? I think it would be a good thing. If we can't do this, then you can imagine what this place is going to become in the future. And my amendment is the way you get there. So I'm hoping my colleagues on the other side have listened to this. I hope that they pay attention. I sure hope that they vote for this amendment, because if they don't, I, I question whether we'll ever have these three trade agreements. Mr. President, uh, I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
زیاد The senator from Utah. Quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. Mr. President, I think we're prepared. Okay, under the previous order, the question occurs on amendment number 641 offered by the senator from Utah, Mr. Hatch, and there will be two minutes of debate equally divided prior to the vote. Mr. President, it's my understanding both sides will waive the two-minute debate time. Without objection. Friend, I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Ayotte. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Balkus, Mr. Beckage, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bingaman, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown of Massachusetts, Mr. Brown of Ohio, Mr. Burr, Ms. Cantwell, Mr. Carden, Mr. Carper, Mr. Casey, Mr. Chambliss, Mr. Coates, Mr. Coburn, Mr. Cochran, Ms. Collins, Mr. Conrad, Mr. Coons, Mr. Corker, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Crapo, Mr. Dement, Mr. Durbin, Mr. Enzi, Mrs. Feinstein. I don't know yet. Okay. Still being determined. Like, I don't have the Mr. Franken. Subject to one, I just don't have an answer yet. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Thank you. Mr. Grassley. Mrs. Hagen. Mr. Harkin. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heller. Mr. Hoven. Mrs. Hutchison, Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Noway, Mr. Isaacson, Mr. Johan, Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Carey, Mr. Kirk, Ms. Globachar, Mr. Cole, Mr. Kyle, Ms. Landrew, Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Leahy, Mr. Lee, Mr. Levin, Mr. Lieberman, Mr. Luger, Mr. Manchin, 
Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson of Nebraska. Mr. Nelson of Florida. Mr. Paul. Mr. Portman. Mr. Pryor. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Snow. Ms. Stabenow. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall of Colorado. Mr. Udall of New Mexico. Mr. Bitter. Mr. Warner. Mr. Webb. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Barrasso, Cornyn, Dement, Graham, Hutchison, Isaacson, Johans, and Paul. Senators voting in the negative. Brown of Ohio, Cardin, Franken, and Stabenow. Mr. Kyle, aye. Mr. Hatch, aye. Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Roberts, aye. Ms. Mikulski, Ms. Mikulski, no. Mr. 
Mr. Brown of Massachusetts? Aye. Mr. Thune? Mr. Thune? Aye. Mr. Enhoff? Aye. Mr. Burr, aye. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Vitter, aye. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Harkin, Mr. Harkin, no. Mr. Beckage, no. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Mr. Grassley? Mr. Grassley? Aye. Mr. Wyden? Mr. Wyden? No. Mr. Tester? No. Mr. Coates? Aye. Mr. Nelson, Nebraska? No. Mr. Alexander? Mr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Wicker? Aye. Mr. Reed of Nevada, no. Ms. Ayotte, aye. Mr. Cole, Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson of Wisconsin, aye. Conrad. Mr. Conrad, no. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Moran, Mr. Moran, aye.
Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island, no. Ms. Landrew, no. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Coburn, Mr. Coburn, aye. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Bingaman, no. Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Sessions, aye. Mr. Kirk, aye. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Lee? Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Portman, aye. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Carey, Mr. Carey, no. Mr. Pryor, no. Mr. Levin, no. Mr. Baucus, Mr. Baucus, no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, no. Mr. Udall of New Mexico, no. Mrs. Hagan, no. Mr. Chambliss, aye. Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Cochran, aye. Mr. Noway, no. Mr. Webb, no. Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. McCain? Mr. McCain, aye. Mr. Warner, no. Mr. Heller, aye. Mr. Lieberman, no. Ms. Snow, Ms. Snow, no. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall of Colorado, no. Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Bennett, Mr. Bennett, no. Mr. Corker, aye. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. 
Mr. Enzi, aye. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mr. Nelson of Florida, aye. Mr. Nelson of Florida, no. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mr. Akaka, no. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mr. Whitehouse, no. <laughs> Mrs. McCaskill, no. Mr. McConnell, aye. Mrs. Boxer, Mrs. Boxer, no. Mr. Lautenberg, Mr. Lautenberg, no. Mr. Schumer, no. no. 